Stanford University. Before I start, let me just say that I, I'd love to see this be a genuine tutorial. If there's something you'd like to hear more elaboration on, if there's a sidetrack you'd like to take, let's go there. Uh, I think that my goal is to make sure that people have a, have a feel for the broad range of issues that, that regulate our ability to bring large-scale biomass energy into the energy system. And um, uh, I, I'd like to go with this topic wherever you guys want to go. I, there are six topics I thought would be worth discussing. Uh, the first is, is, why do we want to talk about biomass energy? Uh, what's unique about it? Uh, why might it make sense? Why might it not make sense in the energy system? The second thing I want to talk about is the global carbon cycle. When, when we use fossil fuels or when we look at carbon offsets or when we use biomass energy, we're really, uh, you can think of us as under a regulatory structure that's imposed by the global carbon cycle. It sets what the large-scale potential is. It sets what the fate of the products is. It uh, gives us a very clear template within which we have flexibility. The third thing I want to talk about is the sustainability issues. What are the, uh, what are the trade-offs that are associated with using biomass energy? What are the trade-offs where there are uh, elements of flexibility in the way we interact with them? And what are the trade-offs that are concrete, where everything we can think of um, doesn't really change an intrinsic trade-off issue? The, the fourth topic I want to talk about is liquid biofuels versus biomass energy. You know, a lot of the public attention, a lot of the research attention over the last several years has been on liquid biofuels. And talk about why uh, liquids make sense or don't make sense in the current energy system. Uh, but historically, uh, solid biomass, uh, biomass used for combustion, has been the overwhelmingly dominant source of biomass energy. And, and it still is today, uh, biomass energy that's used as, um, as a, a source of cooking fuel in, in most of the developing world, and biomass that's used as an industrial uh, product for generating energy. So in the US, especially in the paper industry, um, are still a, a larger energy contribution than liquid biofuels. The fifth topic that I want to talk about is, is the prospects for specific crops. Uh, in the US, most of the uh, liquid biofuels comes from uh, ethanol from corn. Uh, in Brazil, it's mostly ethanol from cane. But there are lots of novel crops that are now uh, being developed for biomass. And we can talk about the strengths and the limitations of uh, perennial grasses, algae, biomass from waste, a, a wide range of uh, potential opportunities, each of which has these interesting biochemical, biophysical contexts and the sustainability issues. And then the, um, the, the final topic I, I hope we have time for is um, I'll call some special issues and special opportunities. I think there are at least two aspects of biomass energy that, that could become overwhelmingly important in an energy future. And I think it's important that that people be aware of those. Let me, um, let's start out in this uh, sort of why biomass energy. Somebody tell me why we might want biomass energy in, the, in our energy system. So. It's captive and it's largely going to waste. OK, so um, it's, it's unused currently. Did that squeak too much? That nah, doesn't seem bad. Probably only see three people can see that, though, right? Oh, we'll forget about the board. OK, another reason we might want to use biomass energy. Stored solar energy, and farmers can grow it. Right. Other reasons? It takes advantage of free biological services. Free bi yeah, excellent. Free biological, well, potentially. Yeah. But yeah, Lena? If it's tandemed with something with carbon sequestration, it's actually a chance to start tipping the whole conversation towards like uh, restabilizing the atmosphere. So it's actually passively removing carbon. Yeah. Carbon. Potentially carbon uh, negative emissions, and we'll talk about that at the end. Other things? Over the years, we've learned how to do it very well. Yeah, actually, uh, you know, especially ethanol. We've done that for at least 10,000. Well, 14,000-year-old beer you can buy now from a brewery in New York. A 14,000-year-old beer recipe. Uh, OK, well, 
the, so l let's just kind of summarize these, these um, issues. So one is that um, it, it's kind of a, a, a free service. As plants grow, they're removing carbon dioxide from the air by photosynthesis, and it's a self-assembling system. We don't have to do anything about it. It's an energy resource that, if, uh, if managed properly, really doesn't take that much input from, from people and uh, the opportunity to harvest is a, a, requires a small amount of effort relative to the amount of energy that's there. Um, it, it's, it's a way to capture and slow down uh, solar energy, to convert solar energy into a, into a form that's usable over much longer periods, and, uh, and we're really good at doing it. Uh, the, um, from, a, from a climate perspective, of course, the thing that's potentially attractive about biomass is that it, it has the potential to provide um, carbon services in a way that's either carbon neutral or close to carbon neutral. And the way that works, at least in concept, is that plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as, as they photosynthesize and grow. Plant growth is essentially removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and using the light energy from the sun to make that into plant. And then if we, if we combust those plants or uh, or chemically convert them into uh, energy and return the CO2 to the atmosphere. We are releasing CO2 when the plant material oxidizes, but you can think of it as essentially returning the same CO2 that we just took out the year before. A fossil fuel is essentially the same deal, right? It's just that the CO2 we're returning to the atmosphere in the combustion of fossil fuel was CO2 that was removed from the atmosphere hundreds of millions of years ago rather than earlier this year. And so the sense in which uh, biomass is, is carbon neutral is that the time difference between when the CO2 is removed from the atmosphere and, and when it's replaced, you can think of as essentially um, irrelevant to the problem that, that we could, uh, hopefully in a sustainable way, uh, create a biomass system where the CO2 was fixed in photosynthesis one week, uh, used by biomass energy consumers the next week and then return to the atmosphere so that the CO2 budget of the atmosphere wouldn't really change in the long run. Uh, of course, uh, the extent to which that's true depends on the amount of fossil energy that we need to use in order to take advantage of the biomass energy. And, uh, and that's one of the big constraints with uh, ethanol from corn. And we'll talk about that in the sustainability issues. Um, somebody mentioned that another motivation for using biomass is that farmers know how to grow it. And, uh, you know, there, there are two important aspects of that the way, the way I look at it. One is that uh, farmers everywhere know how to grow biomass energy, biomass. And uh, it, it means that there is a reliable, uh, quantitatively important energy source that's available everywhere and not just in the places that have fossil fuel resources. So you can think of, of biomass energy as being a potentially powerful route to energy independence, particularly in countries that don't have access to, well, in the current geopolitical context, it's mostly to liquid transportation fuels. In fact, one of the interesting things to think about is that if energy independence were your primary objective with a biomass energy system, uh, you, you might not have a very strong priority on the um, climate consequences or the atmospheric CO2 consequences of using biomass energy. Uh, one way, oops, you can think about um, the way we do ethanol is that corn ethanol production in the U.S. is essentially a way to convert natural gas energy into liquid fuels. And if you don't care about the climate consequences of your energy system, that might be an attractive thing to do. And then uh, a final uh, motivation that we don't talk very much about is, al is also related to farmer uh, issues and that if as a social goal you wanted to maintain vibrant rural lifestyles, you might use biomass energy as a part of a, of a social strategy. Um, if you wanted to have uh, unreasonable farm subsidies, you might have biomass energy as a part of that strategy too. And uh, I think that if you look around the world today, an awful lot of the biomass energy uh, driving forces are related to issues with uh, economic vitality of various regions. And, and it's not that those are unimportant, but I think it's important to recognize that, that, those, are, um, that those are key drivers. So from, from my perspective, 
the motivations for doing biomass energy really fall into these three big groups. Uh, issues that are related to climate, issues that are related to energy independence, and issues that are related to, let's say, vibrant rural lifestyles. Was there a question? Well, I just think it's another motivation economically. Given the complexity of deriving energy from biomass resources, the, the sheer number of people who are gainfully employed um, across the sector involves skilled, unskilled labor, um, agricultural workers, uh, service sector oriented positions. So just the sheer number of, yeah. of jobs that can be derived from this, I think economically is a... It, that's a good point. So maybe what I should do is I should modify my, my, uh, my basket about vibrant rural lifestyles to be uh, vibrant uh, economies in general, in particular economies that are related to the uh, supply chain of, of biomass energy. And you know, part of the reason that I wanted to spend some time focusing on, on why you might want to do biomass energy is that the kinds of biomass energy systems that you select, that you develop, and that you uh, subsidize would likely to be very, very different depending on whether your goals are primarily those related to climate protection, those related to energy independence, or those related to um, vibrant economic activity. And, you know, well, we're gathered here to, uh, to have the annual symposium of something called the Global Climate and Energy Project. And, and at least the way I've thought about the problem has been driven primarily through the lens of the, um, uh, of the climate system. And I think that a lot of the sustainability issues uh, connect most directly with, uh, with thinking about the climate. But it's important to recognize that the, those aren't the motivations for everybody. And I think that if you uh, look historically, most of the interest in biomass energy over the last few decades has a, a, only a small component of being driven by climate related issues. And that's an important, uh, it's an important uh, sort of moderating element in this whole discussion. But it, uh, let me mention just one aspect where, where I think it comes into very sharp focus. And um, you know, when we, when we look at making liquid transportation fuels, which have been the primary goal of, uh, of a system that's focused on energy independence, uh, we take a pretty big hit in terms of the energetics. The, uh, the, the best of the biofuel uh, production technologies probably capture half or a little less than half of the plant energy that you start out with in the liquid fuel and the other half is consumed in, in producing the liquid fuel and in many cases it's substantially more than half. If you, um, if you say let me think about the maximum possible contribution I can get to the energy system, uh, you probably wouldn't focus on liquid transportation fuels as your, as your first uh, criterion. And you would think much more about, well, what are the technologies I can use that, that give me every potential you know, kilojoule that's in that biomass into my energy system? And you'd be looking more at, um, uh, direct combustion, integrated gasification combined cycle, a whole range of other technologies that, uh, that can be energetically very efficient or that might put you in a setting where you could combine them with carbon capture and storage. Okay, what I, I'd like to switch now to providing a little bit of background on the global carbon cycle. Um, plants are big, big players in the global carbon cycle and the <coughs> whether or not biomass energy makes sense uh, really plays out in the, the setting that's framed by the global carbon cycle. The atmosphere has around 750 billion tons of carbon as CO2. Uh, annually, emissions from fossil fuel combustion are a little less than 10 billion tons, eight and a half billion tons in, in 2008. So that means something like 1% uh, of the CO2 that's, that's in the atmosphere is, is released on an annual basis and annually a, about half of that CO2, a little less, uh, stays in the atmosphere and the other half is taken up either by uh, dissolution in the oceans or by um, increased plant growth on land. Plant growth on land on an annual basis removes about uh, between 50 and 60 billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. 
and plant growth in the oceans r removes about the same amount. Now, the reason that plant growth doesn't uh, rapidly deplete the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is that plant death and decomposition releases essentially an equal amount on an annual basis. Uh, the reason that we have a, a carbon sink on land is that CO2 uptake by plants is, is a little bit more than CO2 release, um, possibly as a consequence of recent climate changes, possibly as a consequence of changes in the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere. CO2 is essentially the, the substrate for plant growth, and possibly as a consequence of um, past human activities, especially over much of North America. Um, forests are now regrowing in areas, well, let's say the Northern Hemisphere, forests are regrowing in areas where forests had been removed historically. And, um, and we're seeing a, a, a carbon sink on land that on an annual basis is, is variable, depends a lot on, uh, on uh, short-term climate conditions, but, but it tends to run from about one to maybe four billion tons of carbon per year. Uh, I, I'm going into the specifics of these numbers because they're the things that set the fundamental constraints on how much we could get from a biomass energy system. You know, I said that um, the fossil emissions currently represent about eight and a half billion tons of carbon. Uh, in in uh, uh, the most simple-minded way, we could say, okay, well, if we could if we could replace that eight and a half billion tons of fossil carbon with eight and a half billion tons of biomass carbon, could we completely uh, offset the use of fossil fuels? It, it, it's not quite that simple because the carbon that's in plants is already partly oxidized, almost half oxidized, so that the energy content of, of a chunk of wood is only about half of the energy content of a, of a block of coal that's got the same amount of carbon in it. Well, on a, on a per carbon basis, it is relatively close to the same. But let's just say for, for, for rough calculations that um, it would take something like uh, 12 billion tons of biomass to offset the energy content in what we're currently using in, in fossil energy. And so you could say, well, that, that doesn't sound too bad in principle. I just told you that um, annual plant growth on land is about 60 billion tons, and annual plant growth in the oceans is about 60 billion tons. If I add those two together, that means that annual growth is something like 10 times the total amount of fossil energy that we're using in the energy system. So the real question becomes, you know, how much of that uh, tenfold energy, we could, we'll call it an excess for now, but the, the key to this story is that that's being used for a lot of other stuff, uh, producing food, producing forests, producing healthy ecosystems, but, but there is 10 times there. And so what we really want to do when we analyze biomass energy is say, you know, how much of it could reasonably move, be moved into an energy system? And uh, let me give you one number that, that's always had a lot of influence on me. Um, my group and a, and a number of others have tried to figure out on an annual basis how much biomass is lost to wildfire. Um, wildfire uh, has increased rapidly recently, but it also is widely used as a management tool throughout the tropics. And, and the estimates are that um, annual releases of carbon to the atmosphere from wildfire range from about 2 billion tons per year to as much as about 6 billion tons per year in, in extreme El Nino years. And, and I think that wildfire is a really nice place to start because in almost no cases is the carbon that's released through wildfire uh, used for any uh, major ecosystem purpose or for any uh, human-oriented purpose. The ecosystem services that are provided by wildfire are really pretty minimal and that if we could simulate the effects of wildfire going to ecosystems and uh, get the biomass and use that combustion energy release uh, as, a, as a feed into the energy system rather than as a uh, uh, unused energy release, there's a potential for, for really uh, big contributions. And let's just say that for the sake of argument, there might be 2 billion tons on average of carbon that's being released by wildfire. And that would represent something like uh, 10 to 20 percent of the fossil energy system. So I think there's, a, there's a, some uh, marker of the potential there. And then 
much of what we want to talk about in the context of sustainability issues. Uh huh. A fraction of fossil, did you say that one? Uh, well, fossils is eight and a half currently, so two is uh, 25 percent. Yeah. Uh huh. Part of the issue of the wildfires, though, is while the carbon is liberated, all of the other nutrients are returned to that native soil. Whereas if we were to harvest those biomass crops for energy, we're taking essentially a large portion of the nutrients and that transporting is them to the site. Extremely important point. Yeah, and we'll get back to that in the requires significant <coughs> remediation efforts which would involve totally. So Yeah, we'll go ahead and finish your thought. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. I think you know that it, it is true that that uh, wildfires play an extremely important role in redistributing nutrients in ecosystems. And um, uh, one of the things that, that doesn't work if you push this conceptual model of let's capture the energy in wildfires is that um, if, if you're harvesting biomass in a way that is removing bi uh, nutrients from the sites, you may end up degrading the sites. And you know, one of the things that's, a, that's an important key to successful use of biomass energy is that we, we really want to rely on technologies that separate the, the reduced carbon, which is what we're going to get the energy from, from the nutrients. And um, you know, just a, a, a way to think about that is that if you've got a typical um, soil microorganism, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is about six, six molecules of carbon for every molecule of nitrogen. And if you, if you tried to build an energy system out of, uh, out of bacteria, you'd have terrible problems with nitrogen pollution, and you'd have terrible problems with, with pulling all of the nitrogen out of the system. In a, in a tree trunk, the typical carbon to nitrogen ratio is about 200. And so you end up with many, many fold less problem with um, re nitrogen removal per unit of biomass that's removed. And one of the real keys to thinking about um, biomass energy crops is to find crops that either have very low levels of nutrients in the tissues you're harvesting or to figure out a way to get them back effectively to the ecosystems that they're being removed from. The, the final uh, carbon cycle issue that I want to talk about is, is ag. Um, we think that, that currently um, something like uh, two to three billion tons of carbon is in the crops that are harvested, and something like, like three times that much, about 10 billion tons of carbon is in the plant growth on the world's agricultural lands. Uh, that that's, um, sets an important template for how much we could get from biomass energy, uh, because that obviously is land that uh, isn't otherwise available. And when we talk about the sustainability issues, many of these really concern the question of uh, trade-offs between uh, plants for food and plants for fuel. And when we say, well, what's the, what's the total upside of the, uh, of the size of the resource? It's, it's set by this total annual plant growth. But uh, recognizing that, that a substantial amount of that total annual plant growth uh, goes into the human food production system, and another substantial fraction goes into other systems that are used by humans, um, the fiber production system uh, in particular. And then, you know, there's a wide range of other ecosystem services that are provided by nature that we want to think about protecting as we move into the sustainability issues. Uh, are there any questions about the carbon cycle and its implications for this biomass energy system? Uh huh. I just want to bring up a point that was raised yesterday, and I, I'm really a strong believer that this is not a food versus fuel, it's feed versus fuel. And our choices globally, but inspired by North Americans everywhere, for a higher protein diet in the form of food. Yes, I totally agree. Yeah. We'll come back to that. In fact, you know, um, w when we do the uh, projections of, uh, of what we expect future, the future world to look like, and including carbon emissions, the, you know, the main uh, template that sets the structure of these relationships is the, uh, is the relationship between carbon income, uh, energy use and per capita GDP. And, and in this world of sort of global macro relationships, there's only one I've seen that's stronger than the relationship between energy use and per capita GDP, and it's meat consumption and per capita GDP. 
when you talked about total plant growth, were you uh, including below ground plant growth? Is that a big factor in that ratio? <clears throat> well, um, yes, I was including the below ground plant growth to a, to a, a, a first approximation. Uh, in forests, you see a, a third of the growth go into leaves, a third go into stems, and a third go into roots. And in uh, grassland ecosystems, it, it tends to be about 50-50. Uh, let me just say one other thing about the carbon cycle that's related to this. So 750 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, all the world's plants have about the same amount, maybe 600 billion tons. So if we were to uh, harvest every plant everywhere, <laughs> we, would, uh, we would release 600 billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere. That's the above ground part. And below ground, our, our numbers aren't nearly as good, but maybe about 2,500 billion tons, 2,500 billion tons, or about three to four times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is, is what's in soils. That, um, that's the amount that's in the, the, the non-frozen parts of the, of the world's land area. And the most recent estimates are about that much again is in the permanently frozen areas. And the, the, um, the, the, the world champion of, of carbon storage in frozen soils is in these Yedema sediments, which are mostly in, uh, in uh, eastern Siberia, where um, there are large areas of very deep deposits of windblown soils that weren't glaciated during the last ice age. The, part of the reason I, that it's important to talk about these quantities of carbon in the biomass uh, comes up in the sustainability issues because if we uh, do management practices that release existing carbon stores at the same time we're trying to generate crops that can produce a steady stream of new carbon, we may end up um, digging a permanent hole in terms of the biomass energy where uh, we may be enhancing energy security but uh, moving farther and farther away from climate sustainability. And if there are no more questions, I, I want to turn to the sustainability issues. OK, well, t t tell me a sustainability issue with biomass energy. Other, and, and feed versus fuel, we already got. <laughs> Good. Natural gas inputs into the Right. Are we actually getting any carbon benefits? Water use. Water, very good. Nutrients. Nutrients too. Mm -hmm. Land use changes. Yeah, sort of land use competition especially. OK, well, I, I think that, that captures it, it pretty well. Um, I, I divide these into kind of um, five major categories. The first is, is issues related to, to carbon balance. And those are mm -hmm. the, the natural gas use ones. Are we, when we make biomass energy available for the energy system, uh, actually offsetting emissions from fossil fuels? And with uh, corn-based ethanol, there have been a ton of analyses of uh, whether we're actually offsetting fossil fuel use or not. And those analyses uh, come out with some saying we are offsetting some fossil fuels and some saying that we're not. The bottom line is that it's pretty close to zero, that the energy input that's required in order to convert corn grains into ethanol is pretty close to the amount of energy that you get out in terms of ethanol. And most of that energy comes from the fact that the ethanol ends up in water and that the energy required for the separation, well, historically it was the distillation, uh, it takes up almost as much energy as you capture in the ethanol. Uh, and, and there are big differences in what's called the net energy balance ratio among even the current uh, generation of, uh, of biomass energy that's available the, with um, uh, corn-based ethanol. It's, it's, it's close to one-to-one. -one. The energy inputs are about the same as the energy outputs with Sugarcane ethanol in Brazil, some of the estimates are that the numbers are as high as 11, that you get 11 units of energy out for each unit of energy that's put in. For uh, projections from cellulosic ethanol with uh, crops that are optimized for that, the, many of the estimates are in the, in the region of five to six units of energy out for every unit of fossil energy that's put in. 
Uh, a second major sustainability issue is, is whether we're taking land away from uh, the food production system. And, and I think it is important to point out that, that food needs to be thought of broadly as uh, food for animals as well as food for people. Another, another critical issue is uh, related to deforestation and the, and the carbon debt. This carbon debt concept is, is relatively simple, but it's really important. If we, um, if we have a, a large forest, uh, we might be looking at uh, carbon stocks in that forest that are up to, say, three or 400 tons of carbon per hectare. Is people familiar with the area unit of a hectare? It's 100 meters by 100 meters, two and a half acres approximately. And it's the, it's the metric ver version of the, of the acre. And I, I've never known why, why it sounds so much like an acre, but with the letters rearranged. Anyhow, um, a hec so several hundred tons, about let's say a big forest is 400 tons of carbon per hectare. And we might, from a good cropping system uh, on an annual basis, get something like four tons of carbon per hectare out per year. But if our management system is we go in, uh, cut down the forest, burn that biomass, release the carbon to the atmosphere, we've got a 400 ton debt we've got to pay back before we're actually doing net benefit for the atmosphere. And there's a lot of literature on um, carbon debts in biomass energy. Essentially, the question is uh, if you go in uh, remove the existing vegetation without capturing it for the energy system, how long does it take you till you're actually doing uh, a net benefit for the climate, the carbon system, through your biomass energy system? And in general, these numbers for carbon debts are a few years to um, a few decades for um, converting grasslands to croplands. Uh, they're anywhere from a few centuries to a few millennia for converting forests to croplands, and for biomass energy that's put into degraded lands, there can essentially be no carbon debt, and whatever benefits are accruing can accrue immediately. The, a really interesting and important aspect of, uh, of this carbon debt argument is something that's called indirect deforestation. Indirect deforestation is, uh, is included now in the carbon accounting that, that California uses, and the idea is this. If, um, if I take uh, a hectare of corn in Illinois and I divert it from the food system to the energy system, the total availability of corn for the food system goes down, the price of corn goes up, the um, motivation for uh, agriculturalists in Brazil to clear additional forest goes up because this price signal is transmitting that information and I end up with a hectare of forest being cut, even though the decision about moving corn into the biomass energy system was made by a farmer in Illinois that had nothing to do with the, with the farmer in Brazil. You know, there have been a lot of studies of whether or not this indirect deforestation is something that can be quantified, if it's something that can be real, or if it's really something that's more important at the conceptual level. And uh, it's it's a concept that makes a lot of sense. It hasn't been established in quantitative defensible studies, but it's something that must play a role at, at some level simply because we are dealing with a total land resource that in some sense is fixed. Now, um, there, there are ways to avoid the indirect deforestation argument. One of the, one of the best of those is that uh, currently uh, between 20 and 30 percent of the U.S. corn crop is already going to biomass energy. Uh, shouldn't we, for that land, at least get the most biomass energy possible out of it through some combination of high yields and efficient processing? And then a, a, a final uh -huh. question. Um, in, the, in the first part of your, your comments about the carbon debt, did you say that the, the calculations are based on the assumption that the energy is from the cleared area is not captured? That the, the, if there's a forest on an area that's cleared, you, I mean, yes. So why wouldn't you capture it? That seems like an odd assumption to make. I would think that if you <coughs> use it for uh, coal firing in a, in a coal fire generator, for example, mm -hmm. reduce carbon or coal use, and that that should be part of the calculation. No? 
it's a, that's a really interesting point, and it's one that should be part of the calculation were it part of the way the lands were actually managed. And uh, especially in tropical areas that are being deforested, it is, uh, there's this essentially never any effort to capture the carbon with the exception of high-grade selective logging, which is increasingly occurring in Brazil and in uh, some parts of Southeast Asia. But uh, if, if we were going to transition to a biomass energy system that had climate protection as an important goal, um, thinking about utilization of forests in a way that captured some kind of value from the harvested material, either as energy or as something else, would be an extremely important part of getting the, the sums right. Really good point. The, um, the last sustainability issue I want to talk about is uh, air and water pollution. And you can think about that either in terms of um, uh, d diverting water that would otherwise be used for something else. And you can think about that in terms of uh, uh, consequences of whatever your biomass energy processing system are. So, for example, with sugarcane processing, there's a, a release of large quantities of semi-contaminated water, water that can be cleaned up but takes some effort to clean up. And one of the main issues with the sustainability of the cane uh, biofuel industry in Brazil is, is uh, careless processing of the, uh, of the effluent. From, from my perspective, these these sustainability issues um, should be thought of more as um, a template of constraints and opportunities than as um, a strong argument for using biofuels or for not using biofuels. That all of these are, are issues where uh, sensitivity and understanding of them also suggests some options for working creatively to minimize their impact. Uh, we already talked about the example with the carbon debt, that uh, managing systems such that uh, the initial harvest results in value for the energy system rather than uh, letting stuff uh, go directly to the atmosphere or um, transitioning to uh, biomass energy on lands that haven't accumulated large amounts of carbon is another way to, uh, to avoid a carbon debt. Actually, I, I forgot what, for me, is perhaps the most important sustainability issue. I'll get to your question in one sec. Uh, and that's that landscapes provide a, a wide range of ecosystem services. And, and many of those are associated with uh, providing room for nature and uh, for unmanaged ecosystems. And one of the, the issues we need to think hard about when we think about expanding biomass energy is, is how much land is going to be left for nature. And um, some of the uh, issues are that the, the land that's best for producing biomass also has some of the richest stores of biodiversity. You know, many of the attractive features of looking at, uh, at direct solar are that uh, the deployments are in, in landscapes with relatively low productive potential and in many cases, low biological diversity. But the opposite is true with biomass energy, that the areas that are best at producing plants are also many of the areas that have the most important reserves of biological diversity and many of the richest and most interesting and, and um, arguably most important ecosystems. And so, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a human footprint already on a vast fraction of the Earth's surface and when we talk about an energy system that's using a, a vastly increased fraction of that, we need to recognize that there's a quantitative squeeze and that, that could easily become important uh, depending on whether the decisions that people make are good ones or bad ones. There was a question back here. Uh-huh. Just going to your statement about minimizing impacts, um, is there something inherent in the way we're trying to harness energy that is creating more impacts to minimize? In other words, uh, by attempting to integrate um, and assess all of the potential impacts that are derived from and consequentially affected by biomass energy efforts, are we just <coughs> essentially death by a thousand cuts? Or are we trying to 
trying to <laughs> too hard to assess what the impacts are and to determine these quantitative events and what kind of policy direction they should force us into? You know, the, the way I think about it is that we probably know enough to identify whether or not there's a biomass opportunity, uh, whether it's quantitatively important or quantitatively unimportant or quantitatively dominant. And I think that there's great value for society in, in being able to uh, point to which of those three domains we're in at this, uh, at this stage. And it's important to recognize that no matter how carefully we do that with the kind of information that's available now, information about the way the ecosystems work, about what the efficiency of the future technologies is going to be, that, that we're unlikely to have um, high enough confidence in the answer that we'd want to um, you know, invest all our chips in going a particular direction. But I do think that we know enough to say huge opportunity, medium opportunity, um, not important opportunity. And, and there are lots of lines of evidence that are pushing toward the answer that at this point biomass energy looks like an important sort of medium scale opportunity, important at the scale of um, many percent of a future energy system, but not a dominant one. And let me just summarize one approach to uh, getting that, that kind of information that, that my research group has used. Uh, we started out saying, okay, well, well, what's the potential size of the, of the biomass resource that could be used? And in order to simplify the problem, we said, let's, let's eliminate um, two sets of landscapes from consideration for biomass energy use. Let's take anything that's got a forest on it now and say, we're not going to use it because the carbon debt issues would have to be dealt with using technologies that at least haven't been deployed until now. And then on the other hand, let's take all the land that's currently used for cropping or grazing and eliminate that because uh, we're not prepared with uh, techniques or understanding that let us deal with this competition between land use for the food system and for the energy system. Uh, that leaves us with a bunch of intermediate land, some of which has great ecological value and some of which doesn't. It's hard to figure out how to pick which of that uh, might be available for biomass energy. So what we did is said, okay, let's take the land that at some point in the past has been used for producing uh, agricultural products, either for grazing or for crops, but it's no longer used, figure out how much land that is, how much plant growth that could support, and how that translates into contributions to the energy system. We don't have an incredibly powerful way to say how much land uh, was used for grazing or, or cropping in the past, but it's not now. But there have been some good attempts to do that. And they mostly uh, end up kind of centering on the estimate that something like 400 million hectares might be available. Uh, the, the current global area that's used for growing crops is about 1.5 billion hectares. So, you know, something like a third of the total crop area might be available. Uh-huh, Claire? By excluding all of the uh, land that's already under agricultural production, Chris, are you not also excluding the huge opportunity that there is for using agricultural waste, for using straw am, and plant parts as a biomass energy? I'm going to get back to waste. Uh, I, yeah, but the answer is for sure. For sure, there is a, there's a huge opportunity. And, and, and I don't want to say that there's no opportunity in um, you know, diverting land from um, products from crop areas into the, into the energy system as well. But um, the, 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 waste, the waste point is a really important one. And several of the uh, recent studies have indicated that the, the ability to produce biomass energy from waste is actually one of the, uh, the biggest uh, opportunities and may even be bigger than the one that, that I'm talking about now, which is the abandoned lands one. Um, anyhow, to figure out how much plant growth could occur on this 400 million hectares, it turns out that uh, the, the total amount of plants that you could grow on this 400 million hectares on an annual basis has an energy content of around 40 exajoules. So that's the answer. And uh, What's 40 exajoules? The global energy system 2007 was about 480 exajoules. So at least in principle, if we were to uh, extract every 
jewel of energy in every bit of plant growth that's possible on all the world's abandoned lands, we could be looking at something a smidgen under 10% of the global energy system. And you know that uh, is extremely optimistic to think that you could reach that level, but it's a pretty uh, conservative estimate of the amount of land area that might be available. So this, this uh, number of something like 10% or less of the global, current global energy system I think is actually a, a, a reasonable target to think about where we might get with aggressive deployment of investments in biomass energy. A bunch of questions, challenges, uh, Darren. So but with the current um, estimations for the growth of the population, don't you think that this land, which is currently not used for food, might eventually be reused for food production? Great point. Um, It, it might need to be reused. And, and another factor that was hard to account for in the calculations we did is that a lot of the reasons land is not used for agriculture that used to be is that it's no good anymore. And it's hard to, it's hard to quantitatively estimate the extent of the degradation. I, another, another aspect of that I should mention is that the uh, energy system of today is a small fraction of what we think the energy system of the future will be. So 10% of the current energy system might only be 3% uh, of the 2050 energy system. Yeah. Maybe, the, maybe the reason it was abandoned was there wasn't enough water. And that's not going to change. Well, we have, we have climate change to layer on top. And uh, we might get more water, we might get less. Uh, just to clarify, is that 40 joule, exajoules, uh, exajoules in plant material, or is that including the inefficiency? So that's, uh, that's, that is uh, taking the total amount of plant growth that we estimate could occur under the best possible conditions and just converting that into an energy content without building in any of the inefficiencies in the harvesting, processing, conversion system. So by the time you actually got um, a, a liquid or even a solid accounting for the li other life cycle costs like transportation, you're probably down to half or less of that energy quantity. So wouldn't the percentage of of the total, like when you're comparing it to the energy that's used by society, isn't that number already including the inefficiencies of the original sources? So wouldn't it, wouldn't it be more like 5%? It, it would be, um, I, my 10% my number was to indicate that it's, that it's not 1% and it's not 100%, but uh, I don't want to stick with that, that number as indicating that we know it with any precision. In many parts, um, for example, in the New England area, abandoned farmland has reverted to forest. Um, did you have a time frame after which the land was abandoned, or you didn't include it anymore? Or? So we, um, for this particular study, what we did is we, is we, used, we applied the forest screen first. So we took out all land that's currently in forest. And, and so the abandoned land that we included as available for potential biocropping was that that hasn't reverted to forest. But reverted to shrubland, you included it there. Yes. 10, 20 years. Yeah. And well, let me just say, in a, in a study like this, we're really trying to set the order of magnitude. And I, I think that the message that I'd like to communicate is that uh, based on what we can say now, the biomass energy opportunity is not trivial, but it's not dramatic. It's not, it's not many, many fold the size of the current energy system, which, which one might think if you said global annual total plant growth is 60 billion tons of carbon and fossil emissions are only eight. And I, I think it's really important to ratchet down that 60 to what's the quantity that might potentially be available. I, I completely understand your, your argument about trying to, to set the order of magnitude, but then again, a twofold change between 10% and 20% of our needs is that's that's very important. Totally. Right? So I agree to know and, that it's not 0 0.01 and, or that it's not 100 times is very and, important. And I will feel like uh, my career is complete if one of you goes out and uh, gets a better num estimate of this number following following my inspirational comments today. <laughs> but I, I'd like to ask you what the, what the value for, how, how did you determine a value for productivity? And the reason I ask this is uh, if, if we were to go back 5,000 years and tell a lion that we were going to feed the world with teosinte, he or she would call us crazy. Uh -huh. I'm, so I'm, yeah, I'm, you know, uh, well, we could, that's, it's, it's another lecture to talk about how, um, 
productivity is controlled and uh, what sets the overall patterns of global productivity. Uh, I'll tell you guys an, an interesting number, which is that if you go um, worldwide and you look at the uh, yields from areas that are managed for, ag for agriculture and compare those with what the yields would have been from natural vegetation on the same place, you get that agriculture is now up to producing about half of what nature would have produced. Um, we, the, there are only a few places in the world where our investments in, um, in crop breeding and in mechanized agriculture have actually resulted in unsubsidized yields that are greater than those that occur against the, uh, in the natural background. And when I say unsubsidized yields, I mean yields in the absence of uh, nutrient inputs or, or irrigation inputs. Then you can get dramatic yield increases. And, and the reason that in the analysis that we've done so far, we, uh, we didn't build in the idea of large fertilizer or water inputs is that at least if you think about these issues from the perspective of protecting the climate, um, the energy costs of providing nutrients and providing water are high enough that they tend to wash out a lot of the energy benefits of the, of the crops that are harvested. So for a, for a first principles cut at this, I think a reasonable assumption is that with well-managed biomass agriculture, we might get the same kinds of per area productivity that uh, comes from natural ecosystems on those same sites. Uh, interestingly enough, you can view the history of world agriculture as a multi-thousand year effort to bring uh, the total growth of managed plants up to the level that natural systems in the same place would have produced. And, and there's a, actually quite a simple reason that managed agriculture tends to produce so much less than, than, um, than natural ecosystems. And it has to do with the fact that when we do managed agriculture, what we're really trying to do is harvest the seeds only. So we want um, annual plants that put everything they've got into seeds. And we end up with, with shallow rooted perennials that, that cover the land with leaves over a small fraction of the year uh, in areas that historically have enough water to uh, support year-round plant growth, you end up with deeply rooted plants that cover the area with leaves the whole year. And that, that difference between uh, short period shallow roots and long period deep roots is several fold. We're not going to get to the stuff on which crops, but uh, go ahead. To, to borrow and amend a quote from the former Secretary of Defense, you derive the energy from the biomass you have, not from the biomass you wish you had. So how does that, how will that affect the percentages in terms of our ability to harvest energy from agricultural bio, biomass? That's what I want to talk about in terms of the crops. You know, I think we're headed toward an emphasis on biomass crops that very closely duplicate, and in fact, in some cases, may be uh, modestly improved over the natural ecosystems they'd replace. Really quick question on the, those inputs as you were talking about. Back to corn-based ethanol, are the fossil fuels coming in primarily as the fertilizers or the distillation? Sort of where in the chain are, they, are we losing the most carbon benefit, if you will? In, um, in corn ethanol, the, there are energy losses, carbon-based energy investments throughout the life cycle, uh, field preparation, fertilizer, harvesting, transportation. But in the uh, regular fermentation-based grain ethanol, the biggest energy investments are actually in the processing. And um, somebody may know what the temperatures they use for the fermenters are, but there's a, it's a relatively high temperature process. Um, the huge difference in whether you, whether you dry the mash before you distill it and, uh, and then in the separation between the ethanol and the water. A, big, a really big difference is whether you have a vehicle fleet that can run on hydrous ethanol or needs to run on anhydrous ethanol. It made a huge difference in Brazil when they switched to uh, designing vehicles that could have a little bit of water left in the ethanol. Was there another, I thought there was one other hand that was waving. Well, I wanted to shift the conversation to uh, negative emissions, but obviously have more 
I, okay, well, I was going to get the negative emissions pretty soon, but um, let me let me talk just a little bit about the crops. Um, there there are um, well, let me before I get to the crops, let me, let me talk a little bit about the fuels. So so the uh, I want to talk about uh, fuels, crops, and then uh, negative emissions. You know, so uh, an awful lot of the the conversation so far has been on um, ethanol, which in the U.S. we produce from grain. In uh, Brazil is produced almost entirely from uh, sucrose from sugarcane. Uh, ethanol is a is an okay uh, fuel. It's 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 relatively easy to handle. It tends to be much more corrosive than gasoline. The really nasty thing about ethanol is that it's totally soluble in water. I was going to do a little demonstration where we make a uh, you know, gin and tonic and just show how, uh, how soluble ethanol is in water. But it really makes it difficult to process because uh, you got to, every, everywhere you go, it, it, the ethanol is just uh, sucking up the water. So um, it also only has about two thirds the energy content per gallon of, of gasoline. There's a lot of the liquid fuels that are now, now used are, are biodiesels. Biodiesels, relatively easy to process from a wide range of plant fats, whether it's from uh, palm oil or from soybean oil. The, um, and the, the actual processing can be very efficient. And the uh, biodiesel is essentially indistinguishable in terms of its uh, uh, combustion performance from, from regular diesel. But the yields of biodiesel are typically much lower than the yields of the crops that can be used to produce ethanol. Uh, there also is a lot of interest in producing uh, future fuels either with um, organisms or with thermal and chemical processes that are much more similar to the hydrocarbons we burn now. Um, there's no reason in principle that you couldn't reshape plant biosynthetic pathways in order to produce iso-octane or, or other uh, hydrocarbons that are the foundation of the current energy system. You know, I think uh, whether it turns out that those are attractive ways to go is going to depend largely on, on whether or not we decide we need large amounts of liquid fuel in the energy system. Uh, we can come back to that maybe in a, in a couple of closing comments. And, you know, in the uh, GSEP framework, I get the impression that almost all the thinking about producing uh, liquid fuels from biomass has been thinking about uh, sort of creative ways to harness biology, either to uh, modify organisms to uh, produce the right kinds of fuels as a result of their plant growth, or to, um, to think of biological tricks that could be used in the conversion of the plant material into, uh, into liquid fuels. But I think that there are uh, other approaches that are based on much more uh, traditional kind of oil refinery technology that are, are likely to be competitive. You know, one of the things about uh, oil refineries, the way they work now, is you kind of throw any old junky crude in there and you get a variety of hydrocarbon products out. And a lot of the challenge with um, thinking about massive scale deployment of um, finely tuned biological products is that you'd end up with all these single stream uh, processing systems. And I, my sense is that the jury is definitely still out on whether uh, thermal chemical approaches or biological approaches are going to be the ones that turn out to be most useful. And we, we may end up with a mix that, where you have um, large amounts of capital and can use um, designer crops and GM organisms that, uh, that may be deployed in areas where we're looking at a um, much less managed forest resource, we may see uh, chemical and thermal processing be the way that, that gives us the most energy out. And then finally, I, I just want to say that in terms of looking at the substrates, uh, combustion is the way that we currently get the most energy out of biomass, uh, and that there are some real attractions to combustion. It could be very, very efficient and provides the opportunity to couple the combustion with uh, some kind of carbon capture. So we have 10 minutes. Does anybody want to say anything about the uh, fuels and the differences between different fuels? Questions, comments? OK, well, let's, so let's talk about the plants. Uh, you know, in the US, uh, almost all the biomass energy comes from corn grain. Uh, with 
w with all the plants, I think the issues we want to be thinking about are uh, how, how much do we know about growing it? Uh, what kind of yields can we get? How, how easy is it to process the plant from plant to, to stuff? Uh, what fraction of the plant ends up in our, in our biofuel? Uh, how much do we know about the breeding? Uh, having the genome known of an organism we want to use as a biomass is a, is a dramatic uh, um, uh, advance. And, and how much, um, how easy is it to breed? You know, if we decided that we wanted to have redwood trees be our biomass energy crops, we'd have some real problems in, in going through the generations of breeding that are necessary to get um, the, the optimized organisms. And then finally, uh, what are the sustainability issues? And uh, in many cases, uh, perennials provide a much more attractive kind of starting point than, than annual crops in the sense that with perennials, you don't have the erosion issues. You can tap a much larger amount of the soil. The perennials tend to be good at removing nutrients from the leaves so that you end up with more of the nitrogen staying on the site and less of it being harvested off-site. Uh, so given that, what are the crops we should be, we are looking at? It's currently corn and cane. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about Jotropha. My sense is that Jotropha really isn't um, isn't going any place, but I'd love to hear some evidence that it is. Uh, lots of emphasis in the U.S. in developing perennial grasses, especially miscanthus and switchgrasses, as biomass energy resources. And, and th there, there are two reasons for that. Uh, one is that these perennial grasses have the potential to be a little bit higher yielding than corn because they are perennials and they can provide ground cover for a longer period of time and they have deeper roots that allows them to tap more nutrients and water. And another advantage of the perennial grasses is that in contrast to sugarcane, the um, energy is stored in a, in a stable product in, in cellulose that can be left standing in the field for weeks or months and brought into the factory when the factory is ready for it. One of the big downsides of cane is that uh, cane has to be harvested and processed in a relatively narrow window of time or you lose a lot of the energy. Basically, with cane, we're, we're duking it out with the microorganisms for access to this uh, highly decomposable material. And the microbes are really uh, very, very good at it, at getting to it. With the cellulose, part of the reason that it sits there is that hundreds of millions of years of evolution have figured out a way to protect it from most decomposing organisms why trees can stand up. And uh, the challenge we have in coming up with decomposable cellulose is that uh, evolution has sort of been working against us. Uh, Claire talked yesterday about some really cool work that's going on that um, concerns making the cellulose more accessible to, to decomposing organisms. And then uh, there, there are three other classes of material that are important to mention. Uh, a lot of discussion of, of algae if we had another two hours, I would love to talk with you about algae for, for biomass energy. Algae can be highly, highly productive, but it's hard to, to keep it captured. You know, the great thing about, uh, about a cornfield or a, a sugarcane field is you sort of know where the borders are, your plant grows on its own. Algae, uh, you, can, you can do it in ponds, but, but the basic issue with biomass energy is it's, it's totally quantitative. You have to, if you want to get the biomass off a square kilometer, you've got to have a square kilometer of ponds. You've got to have enough water to fill the square kilometer of ponds. And, you know, there are technology workarounds that might result in sealed uh, liquid containers, but then you end up with cooling requirements. And so my sense is that the algae opportunity is really, really ripe for very specific opportunities. Uh, opportunities where you have excess CO2 from a power plant that you can use as a fertilizer, opportunities where you have a polluted river and you want to use the algae in a win-win situation in order to do both water purification and biomass production at the same time. Um, special opportunities, but important ones. Um, and then uh, the final uh, kind of biomass energy substrate I want to talk about is the one Claire mentioned earlier, which is waste. And there are lots of indications that there's something on the order of at least a billion tons of carbon equivalent in agricultural and urban waste that mostly is just uh, returning to the atmosphere through decomposition. And there's every reason to think that we could, uh, with, uh, with clever application of technologies, uh, capture a lot of the energy and that carbon into the energy system, whether it was through uh, combustion or conversion to liquids. Okay. There's uh, 
five minutes left. I want to spend two minutes talking about uh, negative emissions, but I'll answer a question first. I have a question. You said that Jatopa is not going anywhere. Do you mean that Jatopa is not going anywhere in the US or all over the world? The what I'm hearing is that the Chinese have allocated a certain amount of land about the size of England uh -huh. to plant Jatopa for biodiesel. There are many Jatopa uh, plantations that yeah. are going up in Well, I, I would love to, to uh, see examples of places where these large-scale Jatopa plantations have been successful. The, the ones that I've read about uh, yields have not met expectations. I, I do think there's a real Jatropha opportunity, and where that one seems to be is in remote locations where you're not talking about moving the uh, oil that's produced into the industrial part of the system, but mostly into uh, small-scale sort of artisan-type environments, because um, one of the great advantages of the Jatropha oil is that with minimal processing, it can be used to run an electricity generator. Okay, final thing I want to mention is that, you know, uh, we have a real climate problem. And one of the things that has become increasingly clear over the last couple of years is that that problem is not going to go away as a result of natural processes. If we, if we end up with a warming of two, three, four degrees, uh, natural processes are going to make that warming persist on a, on a many century or millennial time scale. It's also really clear that um, even though GSEP is rich with great ideas about um, increasing efficiency and, and technologies for mitigating carbon, that, that we're not on a trajectory now to uh, achieve atmospheric stabilization of carbon at an aggressive level at a 450, a 500, or a 550 ppm level. W what that likely means is that we're going to end up with CO2 concentration in the atmosphere that are higher than uh, what's acceptable in terms of impacts, and that we're going to be looking at technologies for actually removing CO2 from the atmosphere, negative emissions technologies. And they're basically two big classes of technologies that are possible. One is some kind of chemical air capture, uh, possibly with amine solutions, and Klaus Lackner at Columbia has been the big proponent of those. The, the other set is uh, negative emissions using biomass energy with carbon capture. And in the literature, and it's often described as BECS, biomass energy with carbon uh, storage. And the basic idea would be this. Forest grows, um, I saw down the trees, uh, run them into a power plant that's either combustion-based or um, IGCC. Uh, CO2 comes out the smokestack. That gets uh, sequestered and pumped into a geological formation. I've ended up in an environment where I got the energy out of the plants, um, and I ended up with the CO2 transferred from the plants to a long-term geological reservoir. I can go back um, the next year or a few years later, harvest the next batch of plants, uh, and move more CO2 from the atmosphere into long-term geological storage. At the same time, I'm uh, extracting much of the energy in the, in the carbon. And there are other uh, approaches. We might do that through biochar. But, but the basic uh, opportunity is that biomass energy with carbon storage is essentially the only technology that's mature and available at scale that provides an attractive opening for uh, negative emissions. And when I look at the scenarios of where we're headed versus where we need to go, I actually think that an investment in opening this doorway to negative emissions is going to be an extremely important way of uh, component of how we think about the future. And I know people probably have a, a ton of uh, topics that we didn't talk about. I'm sorry, we're almost out of time, but I'd be happy to answer uh, a couple of questions. Uh huh. So on uh, biomass, CCS, <laughs> yes, and the negative emissions. What surprises me is that a lot of the studies, uh, when, they, when they are basically approaching this idea, they only talk about the scale in terms of size. Like how much opportunity do you have in terms of how much biomass you have and how much CCS you can apply into that. But they don't approach scale in terms of time. Because the rate of the growth of the plant is different than the rate of the incineration of the plant. So if you have one ton of carbon in <coughs> biomass, you can incinerate that in one minute. But it will take a month for this one ton of carbon to grow. Mm -hmm. So from a life cycle assessment point of view, if you're applying that on a large scale, this gap in time scale, how, how do you fix it? You know, um, 
think about it as, as a reservoir, and we have carbon flowing from the atmosphere uh, into the plants, into the uh, long-term geological reservoir. And um, we, we basically um, can address the time problem uh, either by uh, compensating in terms of the areas or by, um, by acknowledging that this is just going to be one piece of a, of a larger solution. One, one attractive feature of using biomass energy with carbon storage as an approach to negative emissions is that you know, the, the world has a very mature forest products industry and has a, a frightening capacity to harvest forests. And so um, forests can be harvested uh, at, a, at, a, at a rate that makes a huge difference for the carbon cycle, but then they don't grow back for a long time, and I think that's your point. And there are two ways you could deal with that. Uh, one is that there are some very attractive features of the fact that uh, forests can accumulate biomass over a long period of time. That can have a, a dramatic effect in reducing the energy costs of going in and doing the harvesting if you get a whole bunch of uh, biomass per unit area after a delayed entry. But the other thing that we might end up with, in, and here's where the sustainability issues associated with uh, impacts on nature really come into play, is we might decide that we want to convert some forest areas into much shorter rotation areas, either with perennial grasses, uh, annual crops, something like that, so that you would do an initial uh, large negative emissions thing and then a, on a small incremental annual basis follow it up. Uh, I think the science on this is really just beginning to be explored. There are only a few papers on it. And I wouldn't pretend to have a complete picture of the way all the options play out. Uh-huh. Oh, Claire. I just wanted to bring up one issue, Chris, that's relevant to your comments about using biomass for combustion. And that is the issue of whether for transportation fuels we really have any credible alternatives to biofuels. So, I mean, what are we going to do to fuel our transportation if we don't develop biofuels? Yeah. We may be able to have electric cars. Fossil fuel sources are definitely running out, so if you want to try to yeah. discover more oil, you have to allow companies to go into more environmentally yeah. sensitive areas, which isn't a very attractive prospect. Yeah. For aviation fuels and for certain sectors of the transportation uh, market, there really is no alternative. Yeah. Uh, well, th it's, a good, it's a good point. Uh, Christina Johnson made that point very compellingly yesterday. Um, I, I just um, was involved in a study for California where we tried to say, you know, what's a California energy system look like with no emissions? And, and one of the things I, I often frustrated at when we talk about um, incremental reductions is that in developed parts of the world, we really need to be talking about zero emissions or negative emissions totally. And we said, okay, well, let's look at two ways to use biomass energy. Let's use biomass energy in the best possible way we can imagine that produces liquid fuels because we don't have an alternative for powering airplanes and big trucks. And we said, OK, let's think about biomass as combustion and negative emissions and then continue to use petroleum to fly the airplanes and the trucks. And with the technology quality that we thought was available, you actually do better with the combustion um, sequestration fossil fuel approach than you do with a liquid fuel approach. I think that they're, they're both uh, compelling technologies, and I think the fact of the matter is that as much as we would like to be able to electrify everything, we don't currently have a vision of how we're going to come up with a non-carbon-based uh, airplane and heavy transportation system. It's a really good point. So I think frustration is the operative word when you ask, where is the plan, where is the vision? In just a sense of numbers, we use 400 million gallons of gasoline in the United States every day. That's at about 20 miles per gallon fleet average. If we took that, and we make 40 million gallons a day of ethanol, something like that. If we took our fleet average to 50 miles per gallon, we need 160 million gallons a day of biofuels, a little bit more approachable. But no one in public puts those two numbers up and says, we've got to do two things at once here. Recognize the volume of liquid fuels that we need. Uh, recognize that biofuels are maybe one quarter of what they could be, but if we brought these two together with a commitment, we, we could be there. And to ignore the fact that peak conventional oil production is going to force this <coughs> awakening on us anyway, there's no plan, there's no, there's no vision. 
other than the good work. I just here. presented one. No, no, no it, it, it's, it's true. Uh, I, I think that, that the, you know, the, the energy system uh, requires, uh, it, it requires leadership and a vision and, and uh, uh, a compelling outline of the steps that need to be taken over a long time period. I, I, when, I, when I use PowerPoint, I, I usually start out with this wonderful uh, cartoon from Tom Tolles, who's a cartoonist for the Washington Post. And, and uh, it's a much better in the uh, projection than in the telling, but, uh, but it, it summarizes uh, what the message I want to leave about the global energy system is. And, and uh, the, the big caption of the cartoon is, is 2060 latest development in the development of technologies to fight climate change. And one scientist is saying to the other scientist, well, it's a time machine. It's basically going to take us back to uh, 2010 because it was then that we should have put in place the measures that wouldn't put us in the situation that we're in now. <laughs> Um, we're, wait, we're past the time. I'm willing to hang out as long as you guys want to hang out, but I also want to give a chance for people to leave. And thanks so much for a great discussion. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.